بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد uh, so we are now doing I think the sixth lesson of Badr correct seventh. this is the seventh sixth it's the sixth of Badr and uh, we still have probably another two to go uh, so we're doing this in quite a lot of detail. I thought I would finish by today, but it looks like there's still quite a lot left, and then we want to do Surah Anfal. So maybe even three from today we have left from for uh, Badr. Um, so last lesson, we were still at the place of the prisoners of war. And we had mentioned that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his ijtihad, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala revealed a verse that basically uh, said that, okay, this time you can do it, but it would have been better if you had done the other option. And the other option was the stricter option. Now the question arises, what is the wisdom in Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala telling the Prophet Sallallahu that the harsher treatment, which was the execution, that was the harsher treatment, was better than uh, clemency and mercy in this time? There are a number of wisdoms that uh, we can derive. The first of them is mentioned explicitly in the Quran. And that is, Allah says that مَا كَانَ لِنَبِيٍّ أَنْ يَكُونَ لَهُ أَسْرَى حَتَّى يُثْخِنَ فِي الْأَرْضِ It is not appropriate that a prophet, any prophet, has pr prisoners of war until he establishes his authority in the land. You see, forgiveness, when it's done out of weakness, is not considered to be effective. Whereas forgiveness, when it is done at power, this is when it is the most effective. That you can, if you forgive and you're not capable of exacting your anger, then what type of forgiveness is? It's not the perfect forgiveness, right? Whereas if you forgive at the height of power, this is genuine forgiveness. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hinted that at this stage of weakness, at this stage when the table has not yet turned in your favor, when you are the ones who are still having the lower hand, it would have been better if you did this to get to the upper hand. So this is one wisdom that is uh, done. That, uh, and here we're going to talk um, today and next uh, lesson, we'll talk very explicitly about, in my opinion, the, the pragmatism of Islam compared to other types of systems that preach tolerance and love but can never practice it themselves, right? That those ways and systems that say turn the other cheek and forgive and whatnot, because this is such an unrealistic mode of living one's life, I mean, if you always turn the other cheek, everybody in the world would take advantage of you, right? And no country or society or people can exist with this ideal. And that is why these teachings cannot be a socially viable alternative to society. You understand what I'm saying here, right? To always turn the other cheek and to always forgive. This means that everybody in the world will take advantage of you. And never has any country that has claimed to follow this doctrine ever adopted it. Think about it, right? Never has any society that claims to follow this ideal of turning the other cheek, never have they been able to implement it. And this, in my humble opinion, clearly demonstrates that this is an unrealistic utopia. This is a role model that it might work on an individual level once in a while, but it will never be a realistic option. Our religion teaches that the general rule is forgiveness and mercy. Yes. The general rule is, if you forgive, it is better. But at times you need to demonstrate justice and sternness. You send the message. People understand, don't mess with me. That needs to be demonstrated. And this is, in my humble opinion, frankly, a sign that Islam is a much more realistic, pragmatic reality. That it deals with the status quo. Deals with how to deal with people. Allah is saying that you shouldn't have forgiven at this stage. Because you are still humiliated, you're still oppressed. حَتَّى يُثْخِنَ فِي الْأَرْضِ when you established your authority, then you should have forgiven. So what is the ideal to forgive? But when is the forgiveness done? When you are powerful. Look at the practical element of our religion. Another <coughs> wisdom of not forgiving at this stage was that, and this is exactly what happened, that for every person that you'll save, 
Maybe for every two that you'll save, one is going to come back to fight you. Because you're still in the beginning of the battle. And it's the same enemy. These are not going to be a different enemy. It is the Quraysh. Right? So you're going to save them now, and the exact same person whom you saved will come back to kill you. That's not very wise at this stage. And this is what happened that some of the people who participated in Badr, they, of course some of them accepted Islam, but some of them came back for Uhud. Some of them came back for Ahzab. Some of them fought in other expeditions. So, this is another wisdom that why would you free somebody that will come back and then try to harm you, the exact same person. And a third wisdom Umar himself alluded to, Umar ibn Khattab, when he basically said to uh, the Prophet that, Ya Rasulullah, give me the Banu Adi, give me my relative, give Ali his relative, give everybody their relative, to demonstrate to the tribes that we are more loyal to Allah and to the faith than we are to the ancient system of jahiliyyah, of tribalism, right? This is a wisdom demonstrated by Umar, that give me my relative and my sub-tribe, so that nobody can accuse that Banu Hashim killed Banu Adi and Banu Kilab killed Banu Abdadar. No, we will demonstrate our loyalty. And by the way, this took years for the Quraysh to understand why are these people fighting together. Remember in the Treaty of Hudaybiyyah, <coughs> when uh, Suhail ibn Amr came to negotiate with the Prophet and he's looking around, he's a Qurashi, he's a Kafir at that time, he accepted Islam. He's looking around and he says, Oh Muhammad do you really think this motley crew, this crew of weirdos basically, from all different tribes. What is uniting them against you? This is exactly what he said basically. Like this, this disparate group. Because he couldn't see anything in common. Right? Do you really think this, this motley crew is the English word? Like literally a bunch of, of, of you know, different uh, uh, people that have come together. Will be able to unite and fight you against the Quraysh? Come on, get real he's saying. Right? Look at now he cannot understand that Islam is more powerful a combining factor than Tribalism. Why would they fight you? As soon as they see us, they will run away. He's telling them this, and that was when, um, we'll talk about that, but Abu Bakr, and he was not one to get angry, right? Abu Bakr stabbed him with the, 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 the butt of his knife, not the sharp part, but the, the, the back of his knife, right? Hit him, and he said a very vulgar phrase, which we would never expect Abu Bakr to say. But his anger got the better of him, and he actually uttered a type of curse word. Literally a type of curse word, which when we get to it, we'll figure out how to teach in the masjid. It's a difficult thing to teach. But the point is Abu Bakr said it, and Abu Bakr is the most modest and the most humble and the most quiet. But this thing made him so angry that he actually hit him. And he cursed him in a vile, vulgar language. Right? Because he couldn't understand what is Islam, that Islam unites us all together. My point being, Umar gave this wisdom that, uh, uh, that if we do this, then we will demonstrate that. Nonetheless, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted, as we said, the ijtihad of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And therefore, the decision was given that all 70 prisoners of war will be taken back to Medina. All 70 prisoners of war will be taken back to Medina. On the way there, <coughs> On the way back, we said that the process and passed by the well. I give you that story in a lot of detail. The, the Qalib of Badr, the well of Badr. Uh, and then he paused at an open area of land. And in this open area of land, two prisoners of war were executed. Out of the 70, two of them were not spared. The general rule that they were spared. But then there were two who were not spared. And some scholars have said this is the only time that a prisoner of war was ever executed under the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That this is the only time. This is one uh, uh, the, the theory that shows that the general rule is that prisoners of war are not executed in Islam, but on occasion they might be. And those two that were executed were another ibn al Harith. And Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt. Another ibn al Harith, number one. And number two, Uqba ibn Abi uh, Mu'ayt. Uh, why these two? As for another ibn al Harith, another ibn al Harith, Ibn Ishaq said about him uh, that he was Shaytanun min Shayatini Quraysh. He was of the Shayateen of Quraysh. And it is said that over eight verses in the Quran were revealed. Uh, about him. And another Ibn al Harith, he was of those who, uh, he was one of the very few Qurashis who, before the coming of Islam, he had lived abroad. So he had lived in the, the ancient city of Hira. And Hira uh, was the capital 
of the uh, the the, the Lakhamid dynasty in Iraq. And this is an ancient Arab uh, dynasty. And Hira was a very magnificent city. So another had lived there for a few years. Then he had come back. And then the Wahi had started. So he was one of the few who had an outside education, basically. When the Quran began to be revealed, he became the most sarcastic commentator of the Quran. And he would say that, what is these fables? I can give you better fables than this. And it is said that every single reference in the Quran to somebody saying these are fables, this is another. In here, illa asatiru al-awwalin, right? Asatiru niktatabaha, fahiya tumla alayhi bukratum asila. There are many such references that they say that these are ancient fables. Asatir is story. Literally, I've said this many times. The word story and the Arabic asatir. The same, asatir, story, history, asatir, they're the same root, which is a Latin root, uh, which has been gotten into Arabic and it went into English as well. Asatir and history uh, are the same. So he would say, these are ancient fables. And he would say that I can give better than this. <coughs> and Allah revealed in the Quran that uh, who does more injustice than the one who says, سَأُنزِلُ مِثْلَ مَا أَنزَلَ Allah. I can reveal as Allah reveals. This is another Ibn al-Harith. He is the one who said, سَأُنزِلُ مِثْلَ مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهِ I can do better than Allah in this Qur'an. Right? And it is said that when the people would come around the Prophet to listen to him, another would come and say, leave these stories, come and listen to mine, I have better stories. And he would start talking about the stories of the uh, ancient kings of Persia. And the... <coughs> <coughs> my apologize, my cough has still not uh, recovered. The ancient kings of Persia and the legends and the heroes of the uh, the Persian fables, which by the way has been recorded, who knows the book that has been recorded in, which is a classic. Even before this, Firdausis. Firdausis uh, Shahnameh. Shahnameh, right? Shahnameh of Firdausi. Uh, this is the original, which is in Persian. And then Alf Layl Layla is, is uh, no, no, that's Alf Layl is, you're getting confused. No, you're confusing me. No, no, that's nothing to do with this. Nothing to do with this. Alf Layl wa Layla is a Baghdadian Arabic uh, tale which has some Persian. No, we're talking about Firdosi Shahnama, which us Indians, Pakistanis have heard more about because it's written in Persian, right? In Farsi, in ancient Farsi. And he's a Muslim, Firdosi. Why am I going to this tangent? Let's get back here. SubhanAllah, sometimes I just go down these, these uh, tangents. It's a very interesting book which has become a legendary in Persian literature. The Mughals loved it. The Mughals uh, mass produced it in, in beautiful calligraphy with, with paintings and whatnot. And this uh, Shahnama of Firdausis, uh, Firdausi Shahnama, it is a history of all of the ancient Persian kings up until the coming of Islam. And that's why it's relevant for us as well, that he talks about the conquering of Islam and the, the, the Persian Empire. In any case, so this guy, another Ibn al-Harith, had many of these stories, the same types of stories that are recorded in Firdausi's Shahnameh. So the ancient fables of the, the Persians. So he would say, come listen to me, I will give you better stories. Right? This is that person that Allah referenced in the uh, Quran. Also another Ibn al-Harith and Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayd, these two in particular, and so they were killed together, they had a lot of tactics together. The both of them decided to travel to Yathrib in the days of Islam, early Islam, and ask the Yahud trick questions to trick the Prophet with. You know, remember the story? Remember we told, we mentioned the story, right? Because of which surah, which surah was revealed? Surah Yusuf in one opinion and Surah Kahf in another. Surah Kahf, the three trick questions, right? Tell us about Dhul Qarnayn, tell us about the Ruh, tell us about... Who are those people that travel <coughs> from, <coughs> from, from Mecca to Medina? Another ibn al-Harith, Uqba ibn Abi Mu'id, these two. To travel all the way, for what reason? To try to trap the Prophet And they came back so happy and proud that now we have him trapped. We have the questions from the Ahli Kitab, the Yahud. That for sure he cannot answer, and that shows he's a liar. And of course he answered it, and then what happened to the two of them? They just ignored their claim. Right? This is another and Uqba. And as for Uqba, I mean, what can we say about Uqba? Uqba was one of the most vile and evil. Who remembers what Uqba did? He has so many stories. Uqba was the one who physically carried the carcass. 
physically carried the carcass in that infamous incident when the Prophet was in sajda. Uqba was the one who went outside happily. Abu Jahl taunted. Abu Jahl said, who can get the carcass? Who's going to do it? Who's going to do it? Come on. So Ibn Ishaq says that qama fil qawmi ashqahum. The most uh, despicable of them stood up. And that is Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt. And he rushed to get the carcass. And he then carried it from outside of Mecca. And as I said, can you imagine a nobleman who has slaves, who is a rich person, he's going to spoil his blood with a dead animal. Stinking, rotting dead animal. And he's going to take it all the way back to the Kaaba to throw onto the Prophet. This is Uqba. This is Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt. What else did Uqba do? Who can remind me? He has a number of stories in the seerah. What else did Uqba do? Any other? Uqba was the one who physically tried to choke the Prophet to death while he was praying. That he took out his, his uh, cloak. Jazakallah He took out his cloak and he threw it around the neck of the Prophet And he tried to choke him. <laughs> then what did Abu Bakr say? <coughs> Excuse me. Ataqutuluna rajulan an yaqula Rabbi Allah. Will you kill a man just because he says Allah is my Lord? This is that ayah in the Quran. Uqba is the one trying to do it. Okay? Uqba is the one trying to uh, do it. And then there are other uh, stories as well about Uqba. What else did he do? Uh, multiple stories. This is Uqba. So when Uqba was brought out to be executed in front of all of the prisoners, he said, why me out of all of them? Like he's literally begging for his life now. Why me? And Ali said, because of your animosity or enmity, adawatuka, because of your animosity to Allah and his messenger. And it is said that Ali was the one who killed him. So Uqba himself, uh, and also there's a, um, uh, in Sira ibn Ishaq, it mentions that right when he's about to be killed, he's basically begging for his life. And subhanAllah, look at his character. Some of the others, they died, however ignoble, but they didn't beg for their lives. Abu Jahl and others, they remained kibber to the very end, right? And um, here's uh, an Umay Umayyah, as you know, he tried to barter his life for money, right? Umayyah tried to purchase himself, right? So Uqba, when he sees now Ali with the sword, he falls on his knees, he's begging the Prophet being saying that, O oh Muhammad, who will take care of my children? Man Sibya, who will take care of my children? Who's going to do uh, take care of my children? And uh, the Prophet gave a very enigmatic response, which we're going to explain now. He simply said, An-Nar, the fire, An-Nar. And then he was executed by uh, Ali. Now what does it mean, uh, An-Nar? One of two opinions is given. Uh, the first of them uh, is that the Prophet is saying, don't worry about your children, you have to face the fire now. You have something far more bigger than uh, you, your children to worry about. Uh, and then the, the other uh, interpretation is that uh, if they follow your footsteps, they don't have to be worrying about taking care of. You have already led the way to the fire for them. So these are two interpretations given about what uh, An-Nar means over here. Also, there's no question that it has to be pointed out that here he is groveling for forgiveness and begging for his own children. Where was his own sympathy when the Prophet's daughter had to come and save the Prophet from sajda? Right? When no other man could do it. Because of Uqba, Fatima, the little girl, had to come running. You remember the story of the carcass, right? And Fatima had to come and, uh, because no man would dare do anything over there, the, the, they, were, they were laughing. Ibn Mas'ud himself says, I couldn't do anything, I was a slave, right? Abu Bakr was far away, Fatima comes running. Where was his sympathy for children then? This is of course the standard, uh, you know, cowardice that is used. Where is his bravery now? That he could do this to the Prophet and now he is saying, Man Sibya, Ya Rasulullah. Also, as I said, and I don't make any, uh, I think this is a very realistic and pragmatic sign, that our religion shows harshness when it is due, and it shows mercy when mercy is due. That people like Uqba and people like an nadr the message needed to be given, that not all kuffar are the same. That people like these, they went out of their way. They are, as Ibn Ishaq says, the uh, shayateen of the Quraysh. So for them, the message is given that there is no clemency, there is no forgiveness. You will not be forgiven. And frankly, these people, they were to the level of all of the others who were killed. 
They were to the level of those who Umayya ibn Khalaf and, and all of the rest who were killed for some wisdom that Allah knows maybe to demonstrate a special death for them. These two were spared. Maybe to demonstrate that uh, the special, if you like, uh, ignoble fame that they got. That they will be the only prisoners of war executed at the command of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam left from the, the battle of Badr, from the plains of Badr, on Monday the 20th of Ramadan. Because he stayed there for three days. 17th is Badr, the battle. So, 17th was Friday. So, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. He left on uh, Monday and the Muslims, he had already sent some criers back, and the Muslims were waiting patiently to find out what had happened at the Battle of Badr. And the rumors had come, because three days had gone by, but they really could not firmly believe that this is happening. Until finally the first person to return was Zayd ibn Haritha. Zayd ibn Haritha, the adopted quote-unquote uh, son of the Prophet And the Prophet sent him on his own camel, Al-Qaswa. As a sign that this is, he's telling the truth, Al Qaswa. And Al Qaswa, uh, the camel, is everybody recognizes. They could recognize animals back then as well. Unlike us, to, to us, all camels look the same and whatnot. They recognized Al Qaswa, they recognized Zayd. Zayd comes so excited, he's saying, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And then he starts mentioning the names of all of those who had been killed. Qutila Shayba ibn Rabi'ah, Qutila Umayyah ibn Khalaf, Qutila Abu Jahl. And it's a who's who of every single famous person of the Quraysh. Right? It's unbelievable. Like this is just news that it's it really is if you think about how many people were killed and who that list is, it's unbelievable. When the Muslims heard this, they became very happy. And when the neo, if you like, munafiqun, because at this point there are no munafiqun. The munafiqun will start right now, today. They will start. This is the beginning of nifaq. Right? So the group that was to become the Munafiqun, that's why I say the Neo Munafiqun, right? The group that was to become the Munafiqun, when they heard this, they started mumbling and, 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 and whispering amongst themselves that clearly was, uh, that Zayd has gone crazy and that Muhammad Sassim, has been killed. And Zayd has gone crazy and taken his camel and now he's delirious and he's now babbling. Because they couldn't believe that the news is actually true. It's simply unbelievable. Ironically, as we'll come to, the exact same reaction happened in Mecca when the first crier came back. That's not true. That couldn't be true. right? Both camps basically were in a type of disbelief that how could this actually have uh, happened. Uh, and so the hypocrites began, uh, and the neo-hypocrites really like, began saying that uh, the Prophet himself uh, is dead, and subhanAllah the nifaq is about to begin now, and such is the way with the munafiqun, that they will leave no opportunity except that they will attack Islam and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. There's one footnote of a sad news here, that as Zayd ibn Haritha was coming into the city, and he's saying, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, one person also heard the takbir, and that was Uthman ibn Affan, he heard it in Baqi' just as they finished burying Ruqayya, right? So the takbir came, he literally heard it the same day that, that, uh, uh, Zayd, uh, that Usama came back. Uh, sorry, not Usama, Zayd. Zayd came back the same day, the same minute, the same hour that it is said that he just finished burying the daughter of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and uh, that was when he heard uh, Zayd saying, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. So he asked, what is going on? What is the takbir? And so he was told that uh, the, 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 the battle of Badr has been a uh, success. And wallahi, if you think about it, the battle of Badr is one of the happiest occasions for Islam and the Muslims. Perhaps up until this point in time, nothing happier has happened. Nothing more joyful than this. And yet still, Allah will that on that day, a tragedy strike. The very household that deserves the most joy. And that is the Prophet ﷺ, right? That Ruqayya, his daughter, according to one, now the, the order of his daughters, uh, we really don't know to be honest, even though there's a common understanding, but Ruqayya might have been the second, she might have been the third, uh, some say she might have been the first as well. Uh, so there's some ikhtilaf, which number of daughter, uh, she, which number of daughter she was, but she was the first daughter to die. That's for sure. She was the first daughter to die. Right after her, Uthman married Umm Kulthum. 
after Uthman married Umm Kulthum, right? So Ruqayya was the first of his daughters to die. It is as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing that no matter how happy you are, this world is going to be a world of testing and a world of trial. That even on the day of Badr, now if Allah had willed, it could have been delayed a week, could have been come back, but the very day of Badr, that the happiness should be the utmost, it is as if the message is also being given, that realize this world is a temporary abode. And life and death does not stop for anybody. Anybody. That it comes when you least expect it. And this is the reality of Hayat dunya That as the Prophet said, every one of us has a long list what we want to do. And before we get to the end of this list, life makes that list, cuts it in half, right? He gave this, you know the example, right? That every one of us has a long amal, and his amal goes everywhere, all the way out. But then he drew a line, and it goes, death comes, and psh, all of those desires go out. And wallahi, this is the way every one of us, when our time comes, we will wake up and we think we have this to do, that to do, this to do, that to do. And where will that list go? It will just go out the window. With our death, khalas, it will be gone. This is the reality of life. It is as if our Prophet himself is being shown. And through him, every one of us. Through him, because obviously he is our role model. That even at this time of happiness and joy, still realize that the ultimate happiness is in the next, not in this uh, life. And uh, so Zayd, uh, Zayd ibn Haritha came back. And uh, the news spread in the, amongst the people of Medina. And they all gathered together to wait for the Prophet ﷺ to come. And uh, the Prophet ﷺ came back with all of the 70 prisoners. Uh, prisoners, And they marched to the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ because they don't have any other place to put the prisoners. right? And the Prophet ﷺ dispersed the prisoners amongst those who had captured them. So he said, go take care of the prisoners of war yourselves. Each one who had captured would basically host the prisoner. And the chieftains or the leaders of the Quraysh were hosted by the Prophet ﷺ himself. And I have commented here before when I taught the seerah, that never in the history of humanity has a prisoner of war been taken care of by the ruler, the king, the prophet that was in charge of the other side of the army. Never has a prisoner of war been taken into the very house that the king, or in this case, the prophet lives in. This is never in the history of mankind. That the chieftains of Quraysh, and in particular, Suhail ibn Amr was the senior most living, and Suhail ibn Amr is the same one who's going to negotiate Hudaybiyah. Right, you can understand who is Suhail ibn Amr. He's the same one who's going to negotiate Hudaybiyah. He's of the level of Abu Sufyan. He's now of the elite of the Quraysh. The, the rest have all gone. Those senior to him, they're all dead now. So the senior most members of the Quraysh, they are housed in the house of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Foremost amongst them, Suhail ibn Amr. And as I said, where in the history of mankind have prisoners been taken and put in the houses of the same roof that the leader, that the ruler is going to uh, sleep in. And this is what our religion did, that they housed the prisoners along with their captors. And Sauda, the wife of the Prophet wasallam, something happened here which caused her to regret what she had done. Sauda, uh, she was with the mother of those that had killed Abu Jahl. Remember the two kids that had killed Abu Jahl, right? Sauda was in their house. And when she heard, so she was not at home, when she heard that uh, the, the Quraysh have surrendered and that the process has come back, she rushed back home, and this was before hijab was revealed, so there's no concept of separation at this time. Uh, she rushed back home and she barged into her own house and there in the corner of the room she saw Suhail ibn Amr with his hand tied up and sitting as a prisoner. That's what he is, he's a prisoner, right? And she didn't even notice the Prophet is next to her. She didn't even know, she just comes in. And when she sees the leader of the Quraysh with her ha his hands tied up, she said, and she herself narrates this, that I, I forgot who I was, that I forgot every, the whole scenario. And I simply said that, Ya Aba Yazid, that's his kunya, Ya Aba Yazid, you surrendered like this? Why didn't you die an honorable death, then live like prisoner? So what happened? 
instantaneously she just reverted into those old days. Like she feels a disgrace that the leader of the Quraysh is now sitting as a prisoner. That she is saying, did you have to surrender to save your life and live like this? You should have died on the battlefield like an honorable man. That's what she's saying, right? Sauda said, فَمَنْ تَبَهْتُ I didn't even realize what I said until I heard the Prophet next to me. Like completely lost track of what I'm saying. Until I heard the Prophet next to me and saying, Ya Sauda, أَتُحَرِّضِينَهُ عَلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ You are stoking him to fight against Allah and His Messenger. Like, do you realize what you're saying? And Sauda said, well, Ya Rasulullah, Wallahi, Wallahi الذي لا إله إلا هو I lost sense of, who, of what I was saying. When I saw him sitting like this, I lost control and it basically, I went back to uh, that stage and فَلَمْ أَتَمَالَكَ عَلَى نَفْسِي I couldn't control myself. Like, so she's making an excuse for herself and the Prophet ﷺ accepted that excuse and this shows us over and over again, we see this in the seerah, the humanity of the companions. This is uh, a very major blunder. And yet the Prophet ﷺ didn't criticize her, like she gave a legitimate excuse and it, we understand her excuse. That, that <coughs> Suhail ibn Amr, the senior, now you can imagine Soda's grown up and Suhail is like the leader. That Soda has grown up and she has been taught to respect Suhail. And she has been taught to uphold the Jahiliya ways. Jahiliya ways. Now she accepts Islam and then she sees Suhail tied up like this. So she said, basically, I mean, I'm translating it colloquially. She didn't say, I forgot who I was. She said, I couldn't control myself. And I, when I saw him like this, I couldn't control myself. So what is the psychological frame of mind that I forgot where I am and who I am and all of Islam? What I, did, what I couldn't stand is to see my chieftain and my leader tied up like a prisoner of war. So she's making an excuse and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam forgives her and accepts this excuse. And the point being that, wallahi, every one of us, sometimes we make mistakes of judgment, mistakes of emotion, mistakes of anger, mistakes of every, we all make mistakes. <laughs> if the Prophet can forgive a mistake that outwardly it is a type of kufr, it is a type of kufr. Why? Because she is saying, you should have fought against Allah and His Messenger. That's what she's saying, right? And that's what the Prophet said, you are encouraging him to fight against Allah and His Messenger, right? But what happened? In her emotionalism, she lost control of rationality, right? And there are many examples in, for example, the famous hadith of uh, the man who's going to die in the desert out of thirst. The man who's going to die in the desert out of thirst and hunger, right? And he's literally dying and then he sees his camel. What does he blurt out? Oh Allah, you are my servant, I am your Rabb. Even the Prophet smiled at his madness and he, and he made an excuse for him. That he said, أَخْطَأَ مِنْ شِدَّةِ الْفَرَحِ Even the Prophet made an excuse for this guy that he made a mistake because he was deliriously happy. Right? So, my point here, every one of us brothers and sisters, when our loved one, when our brother, when our son, when our father, when anybody makes a mistake out of emotion, out of anger, out of anything, and then recognizes the mistake. Let us also act the way that the Prophet ﷺ acted here. That, okay, okay, let's move on. That's it, he never brought it back up with Sauda again. It's human nature that people do make mistakes for whatever reason. Whatever the reason might be. Don't keep on on the same point of that uh, mistake. Now, the Prophet ﷺ, as I said, gave every prisoner of war to uh, the one who had captured him. And he said that... Uh, treat them with kindness. بِهِمْ خَيْرًا I command you to treat them with kindness. And so Ibn Ishaq mentions a number of stories here about how uh, kindly they were treated. That one of them, Abu Aziz, he is the brother of Musa ibn Umayr, he said that I was assigned to a group of the Ansar and every time they sat down to eat, they would give me the, the bread and the meat and they would take the dates and the water. They would take the dates and the water, they give the luxurious meal to me because, the, he himself says, because the Prophet had told them to treat the prisoners with kindness. And he said, out of embarrassment, I would put the bread back in front of them. Because I felt very embarrassed that I'm getting the, the luxury meal, right? And they would take it and put it back in front of me. 
And again, I say this is the beauty of our religion. Strictness, a time of strictness. Those two were executed, right? But what happened to the other 70? They were treated before there were any Geneva Conventions, before there were any of these things. Our Prophet and the Sahaba, they treated them way better than even themselves were uh, treated. And this is an unparalleled treatment of prisoners of war in human history. Never before this time. And that's why, by the way, why were the Geneva Conventions given? Is because mankind realized, you know, we need to treat prisoners decently. We cannot just do this to them, right? Our Sharia gave these rights when no other culture on earth was giving them. That they were given not the same food, better food than their captors. Right? They were treated royally. Suhail is living in the house of the Prophet ﷺ. Can you imagine? I mean, as I said, imagine which ruler has ever taken a prisoner of war and caused him to live in the same house as himself. The same roof, the same food is there. there no Guantanamo, yes. No Guantanamo over there. Yes. This is the reality of our religion. And we say this in light of what happened to an nadr and an uqba. And this is what makes our religion really a practical, realistic religion. A religion that, wallahi, you can understand. It is a, a, a true religion of Allah. Strictness when you need to, but the general rule is mercy and kindness. The general rule is mercy and kindness. So, the... Uh, Prophet ﷺ sent the message back to the Quraysh that these are the prisoners that we will ransom off. And uh, there are different uh, narrations given about the price on the prisoners of war. And inshallah the correct opinion is that every single prisoner, and because there seems to be contradictory narrations, but what seems to be the case, every prisoner was given a price that was suitable for him. That this seems to be the strongest position. That the rich prisoners had to pay a higher ransom and the poorer prisoners pay, paid a lower ransom. So much so that the poorest prisoners basically went away with nothing. They could go back without paying anything. And this again is an amazing uh, reality that what other society will do. And also by the way, the fact that the processor knew every one of them personally. So he knows how much money they have as well, right? That's also something that who else can say? Every single family is known to them. They are after all relatives. They're all Qurashi. And so every one of them has a, uh, a price. Uh, Al-Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet Sallallahu the Ansari who captured, remember captured quote unquote, remember the story of his capture, right? The, the small Ansari who thought he had captured him. So he was living with this Ansari. So the Prophet uh, the, the Ansari came to him and said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, I'll gift him to you. He's your uncle, meaning, you know, I'll gift him to you. That take him as a gift. And the Prophet said, no, rather do not decrease his ransom by even one coin, one penny. Take it fully from his ransom. No, you're not going to gift him. He will pay for his ransom from every single uh, you know, every the, the price that he has. And he got a very high price. He got 4,000 uh, dirhams. 4,000 dirhams was the highest price uh, given. And subhanAllah, again, here we find the beauty of our religion. The Prophet had said, don't kill him. Don't kill him. Remember, that was the command given. Don't kill him. But now that he's captured as a prisoner of war, he shall get the exact price that is due, the 4,000 that is due. Not just that, but the Prophet ﷺ told him that you must also pay the ransom of Aqil and uh, Nawfal. Both of these are his nephews. Aqil, uh, Aqil is the older brother of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Right? The older brother of Ja'far. Ja Aqil was the oldest. And then Ja'far and then Ali. Aqil, Ja'far, and then uh, Ali. So Aqil was also captured, and then Nawfal ibn Harith, and Al-Harith was the oldest son of Abdul Muttalib. Al-Harith was the oldest son of Abdul Muttalib. So Nawfal ibn Harith is a cousin of the Prophet وسلم, and he's a nephew of Abbas. So he said, you will pay their ransom because they don't have any money, you have money. So the, he had the highest ransom and he had to pay for all of them. Now it's an interesting hadith here in Muslim Imam Ahmad that he came to the Prophet and he said that, Ya Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, I'm a Muslim. So why are you putting a ransom on me? I was a Muslim and they forced me to fight. So now he's arguing that he was a Muslim. What did the Prophet say? <coughs> Allahu A'lam. Allah knows your situation. Basically, we have to judge you on the outer reality. Allahu A'lam. Allah knows. I'm not saying you weren't. I'm not saying you were. 
Allahu a'lam. Allah knows your niyat and your situation. And if what you say is true, Allah will give you something better. But we have to judge you by your actions and you were against us, so you must pay your ransom. It is said, and he himself said this, Abbas himself said this, that uh, Allah reveals Surah Anfal verse 70 about me. Allah reveals Surah Anfal verse 70 about me. What is this verse? Allah says in the Quran that, Ya ayyuh nabiyu qul li man fi aydikum al asra in ya'lam illahu fi qulubikum khayran yu'tikum khayran mimma ukhidh minkum wa yaghfir lakum wallahu ghafur rahim. O Prophet, say to those whom you have as prisoners of war, if Allah knows that you have good in your hearts, Allah will give you something better than what He took away from you. And Allah will forgive you, and Allah is ghafoor and rahim. If you're good in your heart, Allah will give you much more than He took away. So Abbas said, this verse came down for me. So Abbas said to the Prophet ﷺ that, O oh Messenger of Allah, you put 4,000 dirhams, I don't have any money. I don't have, how am I going to pay 4,000 dirhams? That's just for me, by the way. Then he has to pay for Aqil and he has to pay for Nawfal. He said, I don't have any money. What did the Prophet ﷺ say? So he said to him, Where is that money that you and Umm al Fadl, your wife, hid on such and such a day that you went out and you buried it? And you said to Umm al Fadl that if I ever die, then this will go to, uh, to Al Fadl, and this will go to Ab uh, Abdullah, and this will go to Al Qutham, another of his sons, right? Where is that money that you hid? Right? So immediately he said, I swear by the one who has sent you with the truth that you are the messenger of Allah. No one knew about this other than me and her. Like he, subhanAllah, look, you know. And this also shows that perhaps even Al Abbas was not that much yaqeen. Like he's saying he's a Muslim. Allah knows at this stage how much, right? And even the Prophet said, Allahu A'lam. I don't know, you know, Allahu A'lam. So this type of incident, so he's saying, where is my money? I don't have the money, right? So the Prophet said, well, you had that money. Remember you and Umm, Umm al-Fadl, your wife, you went and you hid it on such and such a place and you told her on the way back that if I ever die, this much goes to this son, this much goes to that son, this much, where is that money? That's the money I want, right? So that's when he said, I swear that Allah is the one that has uh, sent you with the truth. And uh, Al-Abbas used to say that, so the verse says that if Allah knows you have good in your hearts, He'll give you more than what He took away. Abbas said later on in life that, Wallahi, I wish the Prophet had taken more from me because what He gave me in return is much more than what He took. And he said that, I had to give 20 uqiyas, which is an amount of silver for, for uh, uh, an amount of silver. And instead of these 20 uqiyas, now I have 20 slaves. Each one of them is a businessman trading. And I get basically uh, the profits of 20 businessmen underneath me, right? So Abbas was a businessman. He was a very shrewd businessman. He had a lot of businesses in the end. And that's why in the uh, khutbah of uh, Wada'a, Hajjat al Wada'a, what did the Prophet say about Abbas? That the first business transactions that deal with interest that I will make null and void are those of Abbas because Abbas had a, a lot of interest. A lot of interest that was owed to him. And he said, the Prophet said that to show you I don't want anybody to benefit, my own uncle, nobody has to pay him interest anymore. So he had a lot of money even by the time of the conquest of uh, Mecca. So uh, the point being that Al-Abbas therefore paid his full ransom along with uh, the ransom of his two nephews. It is also authentically reported, <coughs> we hear about this as children and we, we teach our children this, and it is authentically reported in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad that there were some captives who didn't have any money, but they knew how to read and write. And so the Prophet ﷺ told them that they may go free if they taught the children of the Ansar how to uh, read and write, to be literate. And this is an authentic hadith in Muslim Imam Ahmad. We hear about this all the time and this is a very true incident. And we know the benefits from this. I don't need to derive them for you. The importance of education, that education was valued more than a few thousand uh, dirhams were, that the Prophet ﷺ wanted to spread literacy in a society that at the time didn't care about literacy. At the time, literacy was not encouraged, but the Prophet did encourage it, and these types of a hadith uh, show with this. I've also said many times before that Islam was a civilizational force for the Arabs. That Islam came to a group that did not care about culture, about adab, about history, about reading and writing, and it brought them all of these things and more. 
that Islam came and it was a civilization. It, it raised the Arabs up to be the leaders of the world. This is something that I've mentioned many times before, and these types of incidents, they uh, prove that. Another incident regarding the prisoners of war deals with uh, Abu al-As ibn al-Rabi'ah. Abu al-As ibn al-Rabi'ah, who was the son-in-law of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The husband of Zainab. The husband of Zainab. And Zainab is most likely his eldest. Zainab is most likely his eldest. <coughs> Abu al-As, by the way, his mother was Hind. Who is Hind? No. No. The other Hind. No. Oh, Khadija. Khadija's sister. Khadija's sister. You're right. I knew I made a mistake. Exactly. I'm thinking I made a mistake. You're right. Hala. My mistake. Yes. One point. One point for him. Mitai. Mitai. <laughs> I was wondering. It's not Hind. You're right. It was, uh, it's Hala. Hala. Hala, the older sister of Khadija. So, uh, Abu al-As, Khadija is his Khala. So he's the cousin of Zainab, right? You understand? And this marriage had taken place in the days of Jahiliyyah. So this shows us how old is Zainab as well, by the way. Right? This marriage had taken place before all of this animosity and whatnot had begun. And Abu al-As was a loving husband. And there's an incident we're going to come to later on where Zainab gave him protection when she was in Medina. We're going to come to that when we come to it. So Abu al-As at this point in time is fighting uh, against the Muslims in the battle of Badr. And uh, the ransom was sent for him as well. And it is said that when the ransom came, the uh, Zainab, the, the daughter of the Prophet to, uh, to make up the whole quantity, a part of what she gave was her jewelry. And one item of that jewelry was a necklace that Khadija used to wear that she had gifted to Zainab at the time of their wedding. As is a custom till to this day that mothers gift their jewelry to their uh, daughters, right? And so when the Prophet ﷺ saw this very necklace, his heart melted. That this is the necklace that Khadija used to wear, right? And they could see the effects on the face of the Prophet ﷺ that this is that necklace that brought back the memories of Khadija. SubhanAllah, so many as we know, I've given, I've given a whole lecture about Khadija, I remember. A detailed lecture about Khadija that the footsteps of Hala would almost bring the Prophet ﷺ to tears. Right? Yes, that's how you remember it, right? The footsteps of Hala that he would recognize from her footsteps. He would think it's Khadija, then he would say this is Hala. And Aisha would get jealous when Hala visited because she could see the effects of Khadija's memory on the face of the Prophet ﷺ. So when he saw this necklace, they could see it physically uh, affected him. And the Prophet ﷺ, uh, will find out why in a while. He requested to those who uh, owned Abu al-As or who had captured Abu al-As that if you feel it is appropriate, uh, can you set him free? without this, without this item. Can you set him free? So he made a shafa'a, and who's going to say no to the shafa'a of the Prophet ﷺ? So he was uh, sent back, and we'll discover why this happened uh, in a while. That uh, Abu al-As ibn al-Rabi'a was uh, sent back without uh, this uh, ransom. Another famous uh, story that took place was that uh, the ransom was the ransom of Amr ibn Abi Sufyan, the older brother of Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan. The son of Abu Sufyan. Now Abu Sufyan is of course the leader of the caravan. Abu Sufyan is going to be the leader of Uhud. Abu Sufyan right now is the undisputed leader of the Quraysh. He is now the big guy. And so he has been traumatized the most in many ways. Because now all the pressure is on him to make a stand and a decision. He's been utterly humiliated. That in trying to save his camels and the, 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 you know, the caravan, what happened? Disaster in all of Mecca, right? You, you understand this point. Put yourself in his shoes. Like, how must he be feeling? So, uh, he was sent that, go ransom your son, Amr ibn Abi Sufyan. And when, when Abu Sufyan heard that his son was held for ransom, he said, do they expect me to give up my money along with my blood? 
They have killed Hanzala, one of his uh, sons that, that uh, died in, in Badr. They have killed Hanzala, and now they want to make me penniless to get to pay for Amr. Let him remain in their hands. He will stay there as long as they want. I'm not going to pay money for my son, basically. right? And subhanAllah, it is amazing here to see the only reason he could have done this was that deep down inside he knew that they wouldn't kill and they wouldn't torture and they wouldn't persecute him. Think about this, right? That no matter how much he hated Islam and the Prophet at this time, he knows that his son is in safe hands. And the irony is that that's why he can say, let him have it as long as they want him. Can you imagine if he had been tortured, would the father be saying this? No. So he knows that they're going to take good care of him. And it is this irony that he simply says, let him remain there. But he did a very dastardly deed, a very evil deed to get his son back. And he did something that goes against the principles of Islam and even the principles of uh, their jahili laws. And of course, Allah has forgiven him because he accepted Islam later on. That is that he violated the sanctity of the haram. He had something in mind what he would do. Uh, many months later, Many months later, so he's sitting in Mecca for as long as this, we don't know an exact date, but weeks and months go by, uh, that one of the uh, uh, elderly people of Medina, an Ansari by the name of Sa'd ibn al-Nu'man, who has nothing to do with Badr or anything, he's just a person living in Medina, and he's a Muslim. He's come to do business in Mecca and to do Tawaf and Umrah, and as we all know from the beginning of this series, we've been saying that Mecca is a haram, and anybody can go to Mecca, and even the Quraysh would see the murder of their father in Mecca and they would not hurt him, right? This is the law of Islam, it is the law of Jahiliyyah, it is the law that the Quraysh themselves upheld. And ironically, they only went against it for Muslims. So now when Sa'd ibn al-Nu'man came, Abu Sufyan, in broad daylight, kidnapped him. And held him hostage in his house. And he said, I will not release him until you release my son. This is now blatant extortion. There's just no way to, to, to say this nicely, right? Blatant extortion. And Allah has forgiven him because he accepted Islam. But at this point in time, this is uh, blatant extortion. So he said, a life for a life. You release my son, I'll release a numan And so uh, the uh, Sa'd ibn Nu'man. So the, the tribe of Sa'd ibn Nu'man, they came to the Prophet and they said, O Messenger of Allah, this and this has happened. And so he released the son of Abu Sufyan without any ransom because of this, because of this extortion, because of this. Uh, uh, and this is, I mean, again, we see this from the very beginning, the double standards of the Quraysh. That a few months ago, when the Muslims killed somebody in the Haram, remember the incident, right? Sariyat al-Nakhla. A few months ago in Rajab, when they killed uh, one person, they went crazy. Look at these people, they're doing this, they're doing that. When one of their chieftains in broad daylight in front of the Kaaba kidnaps an elderly person, not one word comes out of their mouths. Double standards? Obviously. And this is, we see this all the time in every single nation that opposes Allah and His Messenger. They can talk about human rights as much as they want and freedom and whatnot, but we see double standards over and over and over again. This is, again, this is when you don't have a hard and fast standard that comes from Allah, then you will make excuses for yourself and you will not make excuses for the uh, others. And also see that the Prophet ﷺ, there's an area, there's a, uh, sorry, there's an air of pragmatism here. He deals with them despite the fact it is open dhulm. He still deals with them because what is, what is the, it the fault of Asad ibn Numan? He brings him back and he has him, uh, he, he swaps the two uh, prisoners of war. And uh, of course, we all know the famous story of uh, Mus'ab ibn Umair, uh, that when he passed by his brother uh, Abu Aziz ibn Umair, uh, Abu Aziz, when he saw his brother, he became very happy. He said, oh my brother, now, you know, help me out here now, right? Help me out, now you can help me. Uh, and uh, instead of answering him, he says to the Ansari, he says to the Ansari that had captured him, that make sure he doesn't escape. Because his mother is a very wealthy woman and she will pay top dollar for him. <laughs> the highest ransom, right? So his brother says, Ya Akhi, this is how you treat me? And so Mus'ab said, Hada Akhi Dunaka. This is my brother, not you. Islam separates. This is my brother, not you. Hada Akhi Dunaka. 
and uh, uh, many other stories are mentioned as well. Uh, there's also the story of those who could not afford any ransom. Uh, and of those was uh, Al-Muttalib <coughs> ibn Hantab, uh, Sayfi ibn uh, Abi Rifa'a, Abu Azza. These are all names of people who could not afford any ransom. And they were also illiterate. So they couldn't teach. So what to do with them? Eventually, all of them were sent back without any ransom. And this shows us again, the pragmatism of the Prophet ﷺ, that he knows. And it is said that Abu Azza, for example, uh, he, um, he, he came to the Prophet and he said, O Messenger of Allah, you know that I don't have a powerful family, you know that I have no sons, I only have daughters, I have no money, uh, and I have a large family, so be generous with me. So the Prophet ﷺ freed him with one condition, that you are never allowed to fight against us again. Go back and never fight against us. And so Abu Azza agreed to this and he went back to Mecca and he wrote a beautiful poem which is recorded in Ibn Ishaq praising the generosity of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And uh, this is, uh, again it shows us the, 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 the mercy of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and it, in fact it turned out that, and this is the whole point, this act of mercy caused him to accept Islam. That when the Prophet was so nice to him without taking any ransom, let him go uh, without any condition other than don't fight against us, eventually uh, uh, he accepted Islam. And in fact, many of the prisoners of the Battle of Badr, eventually they accepted Islam, either before the conquest of Mecca or, uh, or, or immediately after it, starting with Al-Abbas, uh, Aqil ibn Abi Talib, the, the brother of Ali ibn Abi Talib, he accepted Islam. Nawfal ibn Al-Hadith, the cousin of the Prophet, accepted Islam. Suhail ibn Amr accepted Islam. All of these people, they eventually accepted Islam. And this shows us, not all of them, but I mean many of them. And this shows us the wisdom that mercy is the general rule and sometimes strictness will be shown as well. Now, what was the effect of the Battle of Badr in Mecca and in Medina after the Battle of Badr? <coughs> <laughs> in the battle of uh, in, in, in Medina, two things are the most significant politically. Number one, all the pagans, the mushrikun that remained in Medina realized that they will have to abandon their paganism, even though there was no explicit command for the process to do so. And so the last remnants of idolatry disappeared at the battle after the Battle of Badr. That it became clear that it's simply not possible for an idol worshipper to remain in this society. And so, paganism simply disappeared. There was never a command in Medina to stop worshipping idols. That never happened. But slowly, more and more people converted, and whoever was left as a mushrik, dwindling, dwindling, until finally, uh, they all had to convert. But at the conversion of these pagans, a new trend began, and that is, nifaq. Munafiqun. That there was no nifaq before the Battle of Badr. There are no munafiqun in the Battle of Badr. Nifaq is a post Badr phenomenon. Nifaq is a post Badr phenomenon. <coughs> and it is said that Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn uh, Salun, and of course he is the leader of the hypocrites, and he was the eldest chieftain of the tribes of Yathrib, as we have said many times, and he was hoping that Yathrib would unite under him. But with the coming of the process, they didn't unite under him. Uh, it is said that when he heard Zayd ibn Haritha saying all of these names, he said, it appears that the matter has now been settled. Meaning, I'm never going to be the chieftain. It appears that this man is here to stay. It appears that Islam is now supreme, and therefore, he outwardly accepted Islam. So the embracing of Islam of Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, it occurred after the battle of Badr. And we know from the Quran that he never truly embraced Islam, that he remained a hypocrite. Now let's get back to the story of Abu al-As. Why did the Prophet free Abu al-As? One month after the battle of Badr, the Prophet sent two companions to a certain place outside of Mecca and said, wait there for a few days and you will get a visitor. Bring that visitor back. And that visitor turned out to be Zainab. So what was the deal then? We find out later on. Abu al-As was freed with the condition that he sends Zainab back to the Prophet ﷺ. This was the condition of freeing him. So he didn't pay the ransom. His ransom was the daughter of the Prophet ﷺ. Send my daughter back. 
and Abu al-As at this time was still a pagan, he will eventually convert. Zainab was a Muslim. Remember, at this time you could still be married to a pagan, right? Those ayat came down in Mumtahina, later on, fifth year and later on. At this point in time, you could still be married to uh, a, a mushrik, a pagan. And so Abu al-As is a pagan. Zainab has always been a Muslim since her father began uh, preaching. And so uh, uh, Zainab is sent uh, outside the city. And there is a very interesting story uh, that uh, takes place over here. Uh, there's also, by the way, um, the uh, Abu al-As, he always treated Zainab honorably. And he never prevented her from practicing Islam. And later on, he was to embrace Islam many years later. I will, as well, and, and we'll mention that story. It's a very interesting story that happened when he embraced Islam as well. So, uh, when Abu al-As came back, rumors began to spread in Mecca that Zainab might be going back. How did these rumors spread? Allahu A'lam. But everybody knew that Abu al-As didn't pay his ransom. So people put one plus one together. The Prophet did not say this. And Hind, the wife of Abu Sufyan, visited Zainab. And said, I have heard that you're about to go back to your father, to Medina. There's no need for you to leave, but if you're going to do that, then tell me before so that I can prepare your baggage for you, because women know what women need more than men know. Meaning, come to me, I will prepare your bags for you. Your luggage, your, 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 your leads, I will prepare for you. Now, why do you think she's making such a generous offer? She has a plan. What's that plan? That Zainab should never go back. Because they still have a hostage, if you like. Right? Daughter. They still have the daughter of the Prophet ﷺ in their midst. And they don't want Zainab to go back. And so Hind tells her that if you ever plan to leave, come and tell me, I'll help you pack your stuff. Don't worry, we'll take care of everything. Right? Zainab was very tempted to take her up on that offer. But she said, something didn't feel right. There's that sixth sense going off. Something did not feel right. And therefore, she did not mention to her when she's deciding to uh, leave. She prepared and she packed the bags herself. And when she finished preparing uh, for the journey, uh, her brother-in-law, Abu al-As's brother, Al-Kinana, uh, so Abu al-As did not want to take her himself because... <coughs> <coughs> he felt too humiliated to take her himself, so he told his brother Kinana that take her uh, outside the city and you will find two of the companions of the Prophet hand her over to them. So this is pre, pre agreed. They all know on this date, hand Zainab over. So he tells his younger brother Kinana, go take uh, my wife Zainab and take her outside the city. So Kinana, not very wisely, in broad daylight, takes Zainab's bags puts them on his camel, takes Zainab, puts Zainab on his camel, and begins leading the camel outside of Mecca. This is not very wise from their part. They didn't think, you know, probably to give them some, some you know, any leeway, probably it's a very emotional time for Abu al-As. He does love his wife. It is his cousin. He loves his wife deeply. He did not want to send her back because of love, but it also shows his honesty that he made a promise and he fulfilled his side of the promise. So we give him some slack that he wasn't thinking straight. So in broad daylight, he takes uh, Kinana, his younger brother, takes Zainab and starts taking her outside the city. The news spreads across Mecca that Zainab is leaving. The news spreads across Mecca. And immediately, some of the Quraysh gather together a posse, if you like, an entourage, to stop her from leaving. That you're not going to go back uh, to the Prophet And a group of the Quraysh surrounded Zainab. And Al-Kinana is trying to protect Zainab. And Zainab's on the camel and Kinana is holding uh, the camel. And Kinana does not know who to fight with because there's so many uh, people. And it is said at this time uh, that Zainab was pregnant with child. She had, uh, in her womb she had uh, a child. And a certain uh, Qurashi by the name of Habbar ibn al-Aswad al-Muttalib. Ibn al-Muttalib. So he's a distant cousin. Uh, the son of Muttalib, not Abdul Muttalib. Going back to Muttalib. Habbar ibn al-Aswad ibn al-Muttalib. He was the one, so this is her second cousin once removed, I think, if I'm, not, if I'm correct. He was the one, Yarhamukumullah. He was the one who thrust a spear to the camel. He thrust a spear to the camel to try to stop them from going. And the camel became scared 
reared upwards and Zainab fell like 15 feet from the camel, right? And she started to bleed right then and there and she suffered a miscarriage because of this. So the child that was the grandson of the Prophet basically, uh, this child, uh, it was, or whatever you want to call it, the fetus or whatever, it was uh, miscarried at this time. And some people also say that she was wounded so severely, this is one of the reasons that caused her early death a few years later as well. Because again, all of the daughters of the Prophet other than Fatima died in his lifetime, right? Zainab also died. And it is said that the wounds that she suffered from falling, you can imagine a camel going upwards and she's a pregnant lady and she's tossed off the camel's back, that those wounds, they lasted with her for years and then she passed away a few years later, three years after this, four years after this, uh, she uh, passed away. And so her Kinana, her brother-in-law, jumped in front of her and said, I swear by Allah, anyone who approaches me will taste my sword and my bow and arrow. So he's a brave brother-in-law, he wants to protect her. Anybody who comes to her, I'm going to kill him before you kill me. And every one of you knows, he said, that how good of a marksman I am. And so the people are now, they don't want to lose their life over this. So they're all surrounding them. Uh, they don't know what to do. They're, it's a type of impasse, like what is to be done now? Until finally, Abu Sufyan hears. Abu Sufyan hears of what's going on. And Abu Sufyan rushes on his horse. Now this is a very sensitive situation, right? Zainab is the daughter of the Prophet ﷺ. Uh, she is also a lady, so there should be some gentlemanness involved here, but there isn't. She is lying there bleeding. So Abu Sufyan rushes forth and he calms the situation down and he promises them, Zainab's not going to leave. You guys get away from here. The crowd, you go away. I'm in charge now, right? So he tells them to leave. Then he tells Kinana, you acted foolishly. Did you expect us to allow you to take Zainab in broad daylight? You acted foolishly. Do you expect us to let you just go do this? Go back to the people. We will not be humiliated this publicly. Go back to the people and wait some while. When the people stop talking about this issue, then quietly hand her over to her father. We have no reason to keep this lady here. Abu Sufyan is being pragmatic. Like we don't gain, I don't gain anything by having this lady here. She's the daughter of, of the Prophet but you can't expect us to be humiliated so publicly. You can't just expect us to let you walk out like this. Do it behind our backs is what he's trying to say, right? Do it quietly in the middle of the night. Don't do it like this. And so uh, that's exactly what happened, that they sent word to the people waiting outside that wait a few more days, you know, things are happening, we'll send, we'll send her to you. And so in the middle of the night, a few days later, uh, in the middle of the night, uh, once again, Kinana took her out and g gave her over to those companions and they took her back to uh, Medina. And <coughs> it shows us again, as we've said from the very beginning, there's always good people in every society. Here is Kinana. He's not a Muslim, but he's an honorable man. That this is just not right. We made a promise. My brother came back on the promise that we're going to send you know, Zainab back and I'm going to fulfill that promise. And he's willing to give up his life to defend that promise. That really shows that these people, they have a genuine honesty and good heart. It also shows us the intelligence of Abu Sufyan. That he really is a politician. He's a wise man and he's a politician. Uh, it also shows us, by the way, there's one of the uh, very interesting things here, that uh, a, a completely, completely unrelated tangent. This man, Habbar ibn al-Aswad ibn al-Muttalib. Habbar ibn al-Aswad ibn al-Muttalib. His grandson was amongst those who participated with Muhammad ibn Qasim with Muhammad ibn Qasim in the conquest of Sindh. All of us know. The Arabs like who? Muhammad who? <laughs> we know this guy since we were kids. Muhammad ibn Qasim, 712. 712, he even knows the date, mashallah. And where did he land? <laughs> Karachi? Not Karachi. There was no Karachi back then. Huh? Debal. Debal. Yes, exactly. So this is a history we know. You guys don't know this history. So, uh, Muhammad ibn Qasim, Hajjaj ibn Yusuf sent him. Yes, Hajjaj ibn Yusuf sent him. So, Muhammad ibn Qasim had with him the grandson of Habbar. The grandson of Habbar, right? And eventually, this grandson, 
his progeny founded a dynasty. Listen to this. That was called the Habarid dynasty. This is the same Habar that we just mentioned caused the, the, the miscarriage, right? And at least seven generations afterwards, look at how Allah's Qadr, yani just, you know, how it works, right? At least seven generations later, we're talking about uh, 200 something C uh, Hijrah, sorry, 200 something Hijrah, right? Not, not under Muhammad ibn Qasim, no. Muhammad ibn Qasim and his people ruled India for a, a while and his governorship. And then uh, the governorship of uh, the Umayyads became weaker over India, what it was Sindh at the time, until finally Sindh became independent from the Umayyad dynasty. And when did it become independent? Under this guy that called it the Habarid dynasty. We are the Habarids. Right? And this, uh, this dynasty, the Habarids, they ruled, they ruled over Makran and Sindh for over 200 years. And they minted coins in what is now Pakistan. Right? They minted coins. And I don't know if uh, Pakistanis are aware of this, but there are cities in Sindh that were founded by the Habarids. Mansura, have you heard of Mansura? Yeah. You know Mansura? Yeah. Mansura is one of these ancient cities that the Arabs founded. You know this? Hmm? Mansura, it's not an inhabited city. It's not an inhabited city. If you're thinking of an inhabited city, this is incorrect. <coughs> yeah, these days it's just uh, ruins. Ruins. It's, it's, in, it's uh, outside of Karachi by two, three hours. It's not at Karachi. Uh, just by the way, uh, I did a whole paper on the Habadid dynasty when I was at Yale. For my, I, did, I took a course uh, called Islam in India. And so I chose to do the topic on the Habadid. So I have a whole paper on the Habadid so I can talk a lot about that. You don't want to be bored to death about the Habadids. Um, by the way, so also the Habadids, by the way, so the, how, when was the end of the Habadid dynasty? The Fatimid Ismailis, <coughs> they attacked. And the Ismailis, the, the Fatimids, they took over Multan and Mansura for a period of time. And they spread their da'wah in Multan and Mansura at that time. And so the Ismailis of Pakistan have been there for a long time. For a long time. And if you know history, when the, the first Aga Khan came back, I know this is a whole unrelated tangent, but all of you in Pakistan is interested in this. When the first Aga Khan came back, you should know this, there was, when did he come back? 1860s, 1870s. The first Aga Khan, right? He came back, he's an Iranian, he's a Persian, he's, uh, he's Persian. When he came to India, he found a large group of Ismailis, right? Where did they come from? The, the original Ismailis came at this time. They have been in Sindh since 300, 400 Hijrah, right? And believe it or not, the first Aga Khan, he took the Ismailis to court because they would not acknowledge him as their Imam. I am not, in, I'm not making this up, this is well known. And he took them to the British court, sued his own followers for not recognizing him. And obviously he won. He won the case. Right? There were two cases, two court cases of Aga Khan against his own followers. Because, and the point in the British court was that I am, an Isma I am the Ismaili Imam, and these are Ismailis, and they are not recognizing me to be their legitimate Imam. And so he went to the British court in the 1871 and 1870, there are two courses, right? Two cases. And he won both cases. And a group of them broke away from him. And so they were called Khoja at the time. So a group of Khojas became Sunni. So many of you are Sunni Bohra and Sunni Khoja, right? This is at this time this happened, right? Another group became Ithna Ashari. So there's Ithna Ashari Khojas as well, right? Before this time, the Khojas were all Ismaili. Before this time. Why am I going to this time? Anyway, so sometimes my mind just wanders in. But all I wanted to point on, and so subhanAllah, what happened at the Ismaili is one, fi one final point. Then Mahmud of Ghazna came and he destroyed the Ismaili dynasty. So after Muhammad ibn Qasim, Muhammad ibn Qasim was directly under the Umayyads. The Umayyads controlled Sindh for at least probably around 80 year or 90 years. Then Sindh kind of sort of became broke away from uh, Umayyads. 
How did it break away? The Habarids. The Habarids. I, I, I should have brought this. I have a coin of the Habarids at home. I have one of their coins that they, I'm a, I'm a numismatist. What's a numismatist? I'm a coin collector. I have hundreds of coins of the Umayyads and whatnot. I collect coins. So I have a coin of the Habarid dynasty, right? I'm a rich man. <laughs> Not as rich as you, Dr. Sahab. <laughs> uh, so I, I should have, well, I had completely forgot. If I remember, I'll bring it. A coin of the Habadis. They have a coin. I, uh, I, per I wanted to purchase it because I, I was writing a paper on them as after I purchased a coin of the Habadis. So the Habadis ruled over what is now Pakistan. Not all of Pakistan. Multan. Multan and, and Makran and Mansura, these were the three places. Sindh, one area of Sindh. Until the Ismailis came. The Ismailis ruled for like 30, 40 years, very, just one generation. Then Mahmoud al-Ghazna came. And Mahmoud al-Ghazna Sunniized it again. right? And then from there you all know the rest of the history, or at least the people from that part of the world know the rest of the history. Again, my point being, why did I go into this tangent? SubhanAllah, look at how Allah's Qadr, where was Habar, uh, what did Habar do? right? And yet in history, when you say Habarid, Automatically, if you know history, there's only one dynasty that was Habarid and it's named after the same person who did what he did to Zainab. This is called the Habarid dynasty. SubhanAllah, this is what Islam does. That Habar was a mushrik, but his grandson accepted Islam and a whole dynasty was founded that was one of the mightiest dynasties uh, of early uh, Sindh. And uh, SubhanAllah, this is how Allah change uh, you know changes people through islam in any case inshallah uh, we are uh, come to the end of today's uh, lesson inshallah we will finish the battle of badr uh, not next wednesday i will not be here next wednesday there will be one week break i will be in freezing canada freezing edmonton uh, so i will not be here for one week inshallah we will resume uh, two wednesdays from now and we will finish uh, the battle of badr on that wednesday and then inshallah the wednesday after that we will do surah al-anfal all of Surah Al-Anfal, inshallah, we will do that. Bidinlahi ta'ala, we have a few minutes left for uh, Q&A, if there are questions about, but no questions about Habadis and Aga Khanis. Let's just, that was just a tangent. So, the two people were killed at Habadis, Uqba uh, ibn Abi Mu'id. So, was there a Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or was there a Wahid? We don't know. There is nothing mentioned about Wahi coming down. We don't know. And in either case, as I said last week, the ijtihad of the Prophet is binding. So, well, it is said that <coughs> it is said that two different people killed each one, but in some riwayat Ali is mentioned for another, in some he's mentioned for Uqba. So, Allahu Alam. Allahu Alam. Okay. Yes, our young brother. No, there was so there was a uh, a stalemate. I.e., people were just around Zainab. They didn't know what to do. Kinana said, "Whoever attacks, I will kill him first before you kill me." So they're just around. They don't know what to do, and they're waiting. Probably 15, 20 minutes. They just don't know what to do. Word has gone back to Mecca. Abu Sufyan is now panicking, and so he comes rushing on his horse. So they waited. They didn't know what to do. It was a chaotic time. And Abu Sufyan got there before the situation got worse. So he came in from Mecca. From the sisters, any questions? Yes, go ahead. Can I have a long question? You always have a long question. There's no, you don't need to ask. Your questions are always long and convoluted. Go ahead. <laughs> Only on Wednesdays. Only on Wednesdays, huh? <laughs> no, actually every single day. <laughs> <laughs> the second uh, the ayah after that says, <laughs> Is this adab of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the uh, adab of uh, war? The adab of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the adab of war? Of Let me ask you if you say it is the adab of war, who would have caused that adab? 
All of it goes back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But, but, but this adab that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about, is it, is it the punishment that he always talks about like in the Akhirah? Or... So the, ver the, the brother is asking about the verse that Allah says to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that why did you forgive, you should not have forgiven. Then the next verse is about were it not for the fact that Allah's decree has already occurred about this, it is possible that Allah's adab would have come to you. Uh, what does the hadith say that Abu Bakr and Umar were crying, why? Because of this verse. Not Abu Bakr, the Prophet and Abu Bakr were crying because of this verse. So they understood this to mean that this was a potential punishment, but Allah forgave them. Well, if, if the Prophet ishtahad, uh, he's, he's not liable for that. If, he, uh, if he's correct, it's two ajr. If he's not, he gets one ajr. He does not deserve a punishment. And that's why he was not punished. But, but the threat is there. If, if the threat is there, meaning it was not an ishtihad that Allah would have liked him to do, but Allah let it go. Well, uh, I think is the, the, the goal of this surah is <clears throat> if the Prophet ﷺ did not, he was easy on his enemies, and he did not uh, kill more of them. That's that. That was the what well, that was the, the objection is he should have killed more people before taking Asra. That a lot more people gonna try him. So if he shows harshness to the people that attacks him, although tragic that a lot of people are going to die, but it's going to save Muslim lives because a lot of people are going to go, we don't want to mess with these people because they kill 15, 20, 30 percent of the world. What you said, I said it as one of the benefits of being strict, but that is not the tafsir of this ayah. Think about it. It cannot be the tafsir of this ayah. Well, uh, Because Allah is saying that if Allah's decree had not come, then adab would have come. I'm, I'm, I'm getting that. So, so if they, and also, if uh, that's that's exactly what it is. If it wasn't for for uh, for you, if you should, if, if if you stop in the middle and you don't continue killing, you're gonna lose the war, and that war is gonna cause you and your people the adab. And as it happened, uh, if, you know, later on in Uhud. That when people did not, did not uh, obey the Allahu I see this as a stretched interpretation. And had this been the case, why would Abu Bakr and the Prophet be crying? Because Number two. Number three, who has preceded you in this tafsir? I, I, this is, uh, that's, uh, you know, since I brought it up the first time, I have been doing research on it. So who has? I'm asking you. I, I, don't have, I, I, I think I read about 22. Uh, tafsir for just so who has read so who who has said this tafsir exactly? I didn't know that it's gonna be brought up. Okay, ta so we look at who is it. If it, if it is the person that you whose pamphlet you gave me, you know what I said about him. I'm asking you to look at the classical Sunni tafsir. See the paper right. that I give you that. You know, we're going to uh, but as usual, Akhi, our conversation becomes private, and the whole people are like wondering what's going on. Right. Well, when you see a tafsir, the brother makes a point that I've been saying to you as well. You have to see who is the person writing it. You ha you can't just you can't just. Objection that you have on the paper. The Bukhari says the exact same thing. The Bukhari says the Rasul does not yesterday. He does not work by by Ra'i or Qiyas. The Bukhari says that in in al Atasab al Kitab al Kitab al Atasab al Kitab al Sunnah. The first. Imam al Bukhari's point is whatever the Prophet says has to be taken. Absolutely. That's what I said. No Sunni says right. otherwise. Right, but he is not making any ishtihad. In any case, okay, we're going back to the same issue of last of last week. Like I said, this is not an issue where Sunnis have a position and Mu'tazilis have another. Even amongst Sunni scholars, some people held this view. But frankly, this view needs takalluf. Takalluf means you need to try to patch up every evidence that goes against it. Like I gave the example last week, illa al idkhir except for idkhir. This is, this is, this is a stretch. This is your stretch. What comes to mind is that the Prophet just said, okay, fine, illa al idkhir Yes, you could say this, but it makes a lot more sense that you just say. So like I said, this is takalluf. This is, 
This is takalluf. There's a print anyway. We're going into this infinite loop, and then again, I tell I tell you, Akhi, what's the thamaratul khilaf? Nothing. Well, actually, it's a, it's a, it's a matter of aqidah because a lot of people say this is this is the deen of Muhammad, not the deen of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Muhammad, he has not. I already explained this to you last week. There is no such thing as deen Muhammad. Deen Muhammad is deen Allah. Exactly. Okay. That's all I said. If you say he can make decisions on his own... And if I say he can make decisions and Allah has told me to follow his decisions. That's what I'm saying. That's bad. No. <laughs> this, is, this is what the Quran and Sunnah says. Right? No Ati'u Allah wa Ati'u Rasul. Allah right? Allah threatened uh, the Prophet and his, his companions if, because they yeah, actually, this is very clear that the adab is threatened for other verses as well. That if he said anything against us, what will we do? Exactly. Okay, so this show. So the, in any case, Akhi, look, we're going into this private conversation. We have, mashallah, 150 people here. So we can continue. If you gave them a chance to ask, maybe they would ask. Okay. Final questions before we break for salah. Please, somebody ask. Please, somebody Yes, in the back. Go ahead. Bismillah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sister, yes. No, they were not brothers. They were not brothers. They were two friends. They were two friends. They were not brothers. Their ha the, the, uh, their their names sound similar, uh, Muawwid and Muadh, but they are not brothers. Okay. Final question. We have two minutes left before nine o'clock. Yes. Through all the seerahs, there's not a lot of mention of the Prophet you know that's a very good question I will look this up he's asking about <coughs> <coughs> he's saying that there's a lot of cousins mentioned from the father's side from the Banu Hashim how about from Amina's side how about Amina's uh, siblings and uh, cousins from the uh, Amina side uh, the Banu Zuhra that's a very good question. I will look this up. Nothing right now. I cannot think of anything right now. But I'll look this up, inshallah. Good question. Inshallah. So as I said, reminder, next week we were not...